my closet there are shelves, and this is where I keep pedals. I went to grab something the other day, and I made a discovery that isn't important at all. The buttons on the mystery box are uneven. This crooked little row of buttons is just a perfect encapsulation of why I find these devices from Dig Dug DIY so enchanting. The whole lineup are just these absurdly lo-fi little oddities, and the flaws complete them. It's what makes me go back to them again and again, and I make more music because of them. So, so I thought it would be fun to get into some of these things, but more importantly, I want to explore the concept of flaws and imperfections in musical devices, and how often they make all the difference and make something worthwhile. So to set the tone for this video, I want to start by showing you a little piece of an email. Dig Dug DIY is run by a guy named Arch out of Rochester, New York, and this is what he said when I ran the video idea by him. I think this idea is pretty empowering and the kind of thing that you can't be reminded of enough, especially with music when things are very ephemeral and there can be strange pressures to get things right, um, which makes no sense. The thing about it is that so many of the sounds that have endured and that we attach ourselves to are fundamentally flawed in some kind of way. So what I've done is broken things down into several different kinds of flaws, and we can just walk through them one by one and, and explore their value. So let's start with the most common and appreciated kind of flaw, which is a limitation. This category kind of acts as a funnel for vintage gear, and all of the imperfections that we now love for giving music character. Delays are a great place to start because they bundle a few different kinds of flaw together. Both tape and analog delay have fairly similar um, flaws to them. That it's important to remember the things we love about them weren't done on purpose. They were trying to produce accurate copies, but the hardware just couldn't do it. With each echo, things warm and go into the background as frequencies were lost, and this is just a byproduct of essentially the same sound being re-recorded again and again. Some frequency was lost, and, and it turns out that's great. Headroom is another one, is that you know tape saturation and, and also just the nature of bucket brigades, they're, they're being pushed to distort a little bit and it gives them character and it's nice. This leads into durability because things like tape machines would wear out as, as well as tape itself and there were different kind like wow would often be a flaw in a tape machine where perhaps a reel would become uneven and a little wobbly. This flutter might come from creases in the tape. We build these things into pedals on purpose now, but at the time they were decay. The generation loss by Cooper effects is an interesting example because the whole point was to capture the effect that happens when you record over and over and over again on a VHS and how you get a certain kind of degradation that happens to the tape itself over time. Stability is another one and can be different from durability. CDs provided a more stable alternative to tape in terms of accuracy and not falling apart over time, but they were prone to things like skipping. That's a nice flaw too. Capacity is also a thing. The Volk sample here has a fairly limited uh, storage capacity, which means that the samples themselves are like kind of compressed, the frequency response and the resolution aren't all there, and it actually uh, makes all the difference for me. And, and as you start to adjust the pitch and time of the samples, they fall apart in a way that is pleasing. Another 
Another thing to consider messing with is tracking. So this won't matter for all things, but it's important for some pitch shifters and stuff like that. Any device that uses tracking will be imperfect. If you feed it too much pitch information that it has to decode or, or volume information, it's gonna trip over itself. And that's good, that presents an opportunity and uh, this, is, this is one pedal I like to trick by putting it into an impossible situation and getting some good unintended results. Accuracy is another big one that nearly every vintage thing failed at in some way. That means not only preserving the frequency response and dynamic range of a signal, but not adding any additional noise. Noise can be actually a very helpful tool for filling out a mix or giving something pristine a bit more of an analog and gritty feeling. So bigger picture, all of this stuff is useful to know about and use in your music, but it also really sets a good foundation for the place of imperfection in music. It's absolutely everywhere, and, and to many people these flawed sounds are the standard that, that nothing else has quite lived up to. So it's it's kind of valuable to arm yourself with that information when when you encounter more modern uh, types of imperfection that you don't that aren't necessarily as proven or or omnipresent. They they can still have a place and and they might be the reason why that particular device will stand the test of time. So let's move along to our second major category, which is broken. So I want to start by talking about fuzz. It's fairly common knowledge at this point that fuzz was not so much invented as discovered. It was the byproduct of a broken channel strip in a recording session uh, for a song called Don't Worry by Marty Robbins. It's a very, it's a great listen actually. It's a really interesting fuzz sound. The channel strip was broken and the engineer for that session turned it into a pedal. No matter what's happened since that point, fuzz is still a broken thing. It's, it's a fundamentally broken circuit that we have organized and reproduced again and again or made variations of, but it's, it's a broken pro audio channel we've actually kind of adjusted ourselves to, to meet its needs. Buzz is the perfect example of a, a broken sound that we just completely accepted as its broken self and made a key part of music. Another great one is feedback. sending a signal's output back into its input. Now this is this is fundamental for a lot of things. This is how delays work, but depending on where the signals are sent and the strength, you can introduce some really raucous kinds of distortion. You can break things. You can make things very loud. If you find a spot just before things boil over and oscillate, there's this kind of ringing presence that can be aggressive without being in your face. This is a really interesting and beautiful one. This is more of a pure exploration of feedback. It's two independent circuits that can each be made to feedback and also be made to feedback into each other uh, using capacitance or patching. It's just a really interesting way to make a destructive stereo image. Another way to use feedback is to use an external feedback pedal to mess with your other pedals. So something like this works, it's what I have. What it allows you to do is send the output of any pedal back into its own input. It can make any 
reverb more or less infinite. It can be a way to overload and make things distort. One of the key things that separates a chorus from a flanger is feedback. So by using a pedal like this to send a chorus pedal back into itself, you can get flanger sounds. Another great example of a broken thing is a PLL. PLL stands for phase lock loop, and it is essentially a way to keep things in sync with each other using phase. The interesting thing about PLLs is that it's, it's kind of a good system. The pedals that take advantage of it, at least when it comes to guitar stuff, they intentionally screw with the tracking. So you have this phase detector finding the phase of the thing that you want to follow, usually with an oscillator, and it's, it's relaxing the communication of that information and essentially not giving the oscillator a chance. It's, it's sabotaging, and that's, that's become the sound that people turn to with the PL. So that's broken. Whether accidental or on purpose, broken things can be useful. Okay, our third category is raw. What this describes is things that are kind of unfinished or a bit crude. This is an example. This pedal is actually a bit of a prototype. It's a transition from a first test to the production unit. One of the critical flaws of it is that it doesn't have an LED to show you when it's on. It's two channels of delay and sampling, and I use it because of how messed up it is. It, it makes it special for me. These are some other good examples of raw. These are, these are walkie-talkies that were turned into pedals. You have an input, a transmitter, and a receiver. You can just put it across the room and it'll send the signal. As gimmicky as it sounds, this is an almost perfect kind of fuzz sound to me. The thing to remember here is that each of us is different and we all prefer slightly different voicings and control systems and everything else. So it's entirely possible that the prototype of something is more suited to your tastes than the finished version. So if you have a chance to try out prototypes um, or just want to try things from lesser known builders, maybe even less professional, that may actually get you what you're looking for instead of something that's so polished that maybe it sounds too similar to everything else. All right, final category. This is an interesting one. Cryptic. What this means is a device intentionally created to be a little mysterious. I find this most common in modular. Uh, this company, Mannequins in particular, have extremely cryptic manuals to, to promote more of a playful approach. And uh, Make Noise is another company that is, is known for doing this on purpose. Look at this circuit board. It's cool. The Permutate is my favorite plug-in for creative things, and it's a, it's a very good example of this. Really all of these switches could be replaced by numbers, but it's so much better for being the way that it is. It makes me want to use it more, and I get better results by poking around. Now I'm including cryptic as a flaw because it is still a, a barrier to understanding that some people will hate, um, but it is a kind of flaw that, that can inspire and encourages play. So that is here for that reason. Okay, Dig Dug. Dig Dug DIY. Dig Dug is the perfect final boss for this subject because to me, it is a little bit of everything. The hardware is just pushing up against its absolute limits. They're unlabeled and they're raw. The design ethos that goes into these devices is to just do your best at the current moment. They are the best that a person could do at a moment in time. And then he released it and moved on. They are instruments with soul. 
and let's play music with them.